What's up, champs? Welcome back to the Short Shifts Fantasy Hockey Podcast. I am your host, Ben Burnett. Joining me, as always, Lucas Z. <laughs> <laughs> joining me, joining me as always, my pal and yours, Lewis Ezekiel. Lewis, we had to retake the intro a few times because I called you Lucas Ezekiel. Uh, what do you think? You, you into? The I Lu- love it. You, yeah. I am. I am adopting Lucas Raymond as my large adult son and also my namesake. I'm into it, and I think we should stick with it moving forward. <laughs> All right, let's. We're retconning uh, the entirety of the series history of short shifts. Actually, the reason I thought of Lucas is not to do with Lucas Raymond right now. It's because Lucas Carlson is the newest keep member of the Keeping Carlson family. Two primary assists for the Panthers tonight. Um, I don't have him on my hot streaks list, but maybe if he keeps it up, Brian and Elon will be chatting about him on two on a Sunday. Yeah, another tough look for Sergei Bobrovsky because the comeback starts the moment they pull him. Uh, it looks grim, uh, but it, it might be nice for those night owners who maybe left him in an open slot. For sure. Lewis, uh, let's get started tonight. We have a lot of shifts to get through. We're going to start in San Jose. Uh, and I, I guess I just want to start where I want to talk about Evander Kane just briefly uh, to give an update on his status. There were some very troubling videos and posts made to social media uh, by Evander Kane's wife and then a statement from Evander Kane. And it's turning into this real media sideshow that is honestly a terrible look for everyone. I don't want to get into any of that. And I really don't recommend, honestly, that you watch the video that was posted to social media if you ha- if you have no interest in it. But I, when I went to Yahoo to look up Evander Kane, see what his ownership rate is, he's at 30% rostered. So obviously there are quite a few folks who are currently holding him to see what goes on with him. Today it was announced that the Barracuda, uh, the San Jose Barracuda, the the Sharks AHL affiliate, will have Kane in their lineup once he's back in game shape. So he started practicing, I believe, Wednesday of this week. There's no word on when that will be, but it's presumably not like, you know, today or tomorrow. Um My recommendation is probably to not hold on to Evander Kane unless you're in a very uh, a very competitive spot, aka like you're crushing it and you are not worried about the playoffs. If you're in a hyper competitive league, I guess that's probably how how I should be using that word. Uh, I would be looking for points elsewhere because I don't think Kane is coming back too quickly. Lewis, I don't even really want to talk about Kane any more than that. I want to go on to players who are not getting uh, making me feel sad when I read about read news about them. And so let's go to St. Louis next, uh, where Jordan Bennington hits COVID protocol. He is now out for at least 10 days, which equates to six games. Ville Husso gets the start tonight. Uh, going into tonight's game, four games played for Husso on the season, a 3-1 and record with a 936 save percentage and a sub 2.0 GAA. I think it's time to fire up those stream engines. What do you think? Yeah, I like it. You know, we're seeing a lot of goalie issues right now. And, you know, of them, I think so really, you know, has the most clarity on how long he's going to get a shot here. You know, Bennington has been pretty lackluster, uh, ever since the first couple weeks of the season where he came out pretty hot. I think the upshot of this really is, you know, Huso has a chance, obviously, uh, He's going to have a chance to start some games. He's got some tough opponents in there. They've got uh, Tampa tonight with Stamkos back. They've got uh, two games against the Panthers coming up as well. But if he can acquit himself reasonably well in there, I think there is an upshot where he might be able to eat into a few more shots. We know uh, that Barube has talked about you know, giving Huso an opportunity to potentially take on some of these starts and start outside of just back-to-backs. Uh, so I would definitely keep my eye on Huso. I know a lot of managers jumped on him very quickly, so he may not be around in your league. But if people were feeling a little hesitant, especially with this tough stretch that he has coming up, he seems to be acquitting himself right now uh, against Tampa. If I were Brian, I would definitely say touch wood here or knock on wood is what we would usually say. But in any case, uh, hopefully I'm not jinxing that. But, you know, maybe take a look at your waiver wires this morning and see if Huso is lying around. He does, again, have some tough matchups coming up. But if he can do well, he might eat into those Bennington starts a little bit because Bennington has been only so-so. Yeah, 24 of 25 through 40 minutes for Huso against the Lightning. A really solid start there. 
you mentioned the the games coming up against Florida. I'm honestly, um, I'm I'm into streaming him regardless in leagues where you're desperate for starts because he's been so good and the Blues have been pretty solid as well. I think the trick to beating Florida Lewis, I'm picking up on this, you don't go up 4 nothing on them or 4-1. You keep it close, right? That way they don't get to have the massive, uh, the massive multi-goal comeback. That's the trick. Yeah, you're talking, of course, about the huge comeback they had against Washington, where they just utterly dominated the third period. You know, I, I think Washington managed like a couple shots versus 20 plus from Florida, and they managed to come back and win the game, not even overtime, but in regulation. Uh, that was a wild one. Well, they were down 4-1 again tonight. It is now 4-3 heading into the third. So I'm I'm calling my shot once again. It's it's Ben's classic prediction corner. Uh, Lewis, why don't we uh, take it to the next shift, and uh, I'll let you get us started on this one. Yeah, so I mentioned that there was some weird goalie stuff going on. Apparently, Darcy Kemper was injured with a shot to the head. The Avs had to scramble and start Jonas Johansson against Toronto. Toronto just came out and dominated Colorado to the tune of 8-3. to three. It was very rough. It was never really a competitive game. Uh, Johansson looked pretty shell-shocked out there. I kind of want to give him the benefit of the doubt because, you know, he didn't necessarily expect to start. He's also starting the second half of that back-to-back uh, and has only allowed one goal so far. Obviously, the level of competition between Toronto and Montreal, uh, there's a significant difference there. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt. Um, but nice to see him, you know, be able to bounce back a little bit and they're not going to have to rely, uh, on any sort of emergency third goalie. Um, you know, meanwhile, Pavel Francouz is on a conditioning stint in the AHL. They said initially that it was going to be, you know, a decently long one. He hasn't played in the NHL in over a year. Uh, he's going to need some time to get back into game shape. There were some, you know, starry eyed optimists who had have been holding Francis in their IR for a long time, hoping that, you know, who knows, maybe they'll cut that short and call him into play today. Obviously, that was not the case on Thursday night. Um, but yeah, that puts us in a position where Johansson is, as of right now, the starting goalie for a decent team, even if they couldn't hold up against Toronto, but no one really has been able to lately. Uh, so what do you think? Is Johansson worth a stream? Is Francis worth a stash? Yeah, I would be streaming in Johansson, probably go Huso over uh, Johansson, just because he's looked like the better goalie so far this season. And he also, uh, I think there's less competition breathing down his neck. I am the type of person to be highly skeptical of a player like Francois, who's been out for so long. Um, It just... I think it's really difficult for players to miss that much time and and return at the same level that they left at. And Francois really is a guy who we saw have a few solid months, and there have just been so many injuries over the past few years. So I'm not uh, I'm not really a Francois guy myself. Um, that's not a bet that I'm you know going far out of my way to make. Yeah, a certified band aid boy to be sure. Uh, I think it'll be worthwhile to see how he does in his conditioning stint. Obviously, the AHL is not NHL competition, but, you know, hopefully he can kind of get back into things here. He did have quite a lot of success during the rare times when he was not injured. Uh, I used my last move of the week to pick him up. I have a pretty nice cushion in my match, uh, so I thought it was worth the risk, and I'm hoping that Jordan Eberle may be able to come back so I'm not just carrying an empty slot on my roster. Uh, we will see if by Sunday I am regretting that, but, you know, it, it seemed like a uh, a shot worth taking, especially since Huso got snapped up uh, really quickly as well. Uh, let's transition to a team that is back in action after uh, a few days off here. The New York Islanders are playing here on Thursday night. Uh, we had a question from patron Jordan Q about which Islanders might be worth holding on to. And we've talked a lot about the Isles struggle, so I will try to be brief here. Um, I was talking about, you know, dropping Anders Lee and, you know, that being a valuable strategy. And I took some flack on Twitter from some people who thought that, you know, he was going to get poached by other people and that he was going to lose value. But uh, right after that, they had a bunch of these canceled COVID games and Lee hadn't done a whole lot. Uh, listen, the, the Isles, as we've said many times, they played most of their games away from home. They've endured a COVID outbreak. It's tough. We did have Barzil score uh, here on Thursday night, so some signs of life from him. You know, I really think that he and Sorokin are the key holds, and I think you can live without almost everyone else. Um, but I did just want to point out, since this was an interesting question, uh, it is worth noting that as the season wears on, keep an eye on these guys. If they do start to heat up and become worth wa- rostering, the Isles have a favorable schedule towards the end of the season with 16 games in 31 days in March, so they may really be beneficial for you in crunch time, uh, especially 
especially if you are off to a good start and can afford to, you know, hang on to them maybe through some, some lean, uh, weeks in the meantime. Uh, I'm getting this from the Dabber Hockey Rambling from this morning written by Michael Clifford at Slim Cliffy on Twitter. Uh, and he wrote about some advantageous playoff schedules in Thursday's ramblings, uh, including teams like the Isles, the Avalanche and the Sun. So, uh, if you are in a good spot, you know, you've been listening to the show, you're crushing your, your league with your buddies because you're tuned in to, uh, you know, the good info in the hockey world and they are not. Um, you know, I recommend you check it out because it's got some good advice for the folks. You know, usually we're talking about things to help you, uh, you know, scrape across another win. But if you're just dominating everybody, you know, it's some good advice for people who are already doing well and, you know, could use some advice to help them win those playoff rounds. I uh, I like Anders Lee. I don't know why you're so down on him on that top line with Barzell. Did not get in on the goal today. But uh, I, I think it's actually kind of solid for him to be able to come back from the COVID break and have a little bit more time to rehab the injury that he, that put him out for most of the beginning of the season. Uh, yeah, I like Anders Lee just fine. I also like Brock Nelson, a guy who you're able to keep in your IR. Uh, Ryan Pulak has value to me in bangers leagues. We've discussed, or I think I discussed Semyon Varlamov with Elon on the episode that he guested, but I'm, uh, I'm not overly in love with most of the Islanders roster, as you mentioned. I think I, I pretty much agree with you on most of what you're saying. Just a, a few players who, to me, are interesting in deeper leagues, especially if you're able to kind of snipe, kind of poach them off the waiver wire when you wouldn't normally be able to get a line one, power play one guy off the wire. Uh, Lewis, we are going to take a very quick break. When we come back, we're going to be talking cold streaks and hot streaks. You're listening to Short Shifts. Welcome back to Short Shifts. Lewis, I am going to throw the ball right over into your court to start us off on our streak segment today. All right. So I wanted to talk about uh, the hot streak. Really, it's like a one night hot streak for the Predators. Obviously, they've been doing very well. Uh, the line of Forsberg, Granlin, and Duchesne. Um, but they deserve some special praise for their effort on Tuesday. Uh, Forsberg scored four goals on Tuesday. Each one received a primary assist from Mikhail Granlin. That line has just been so impressive. They have the highest goals per 60 league, uh, rate in the league, uh, by a full goal per 60 over the next closest, uh, the Dallin Couture Meyer line, which is kind of a surprise there, I think. Um, but very cool that they are up there as well. They are potting 83% of the goals scored where they, when they are on the ice, good for third in the league. They're controlling nearly 60% of the shots when they're on the ice. This is just great success for a line that last year had some really strong underlying numbers, but was not able to convert them into real offense. So a lot of people were looking at that and saying, you know, man, I wish they could find that success. Um, it was one of the reasons, you know, talking with some of the folks from on the forecheck, uh, Nashville Predators blog that, you know, I was feeling confident about picking up, you know, a player like Duchesne, for instance. Uh, you know, I really wanted to go out and get Saros. I really wanted to go out and get Yossi because I thought there was some real potential there. And they really are turning it into, uh, some fantasy success. The one question, of course, that we have is if Nashville is going to be able to stay in the playoff hunt or if they might be sellers come the trade deadline. Cause with just one year left, you know, wrapping up that final year on the Forsberg contract, he could potentially find himself as trade bait for a uh, competitive playoff team. Would be a bummer, certainly, to see that line being broken up by a Forsberg trade. Although, uh, you know, they were able to find some success, uh, with Luke Cunning on that line, uh, when Forsberg was injured. So maybe they'd be okay without him. But, you know, obviously coming out with that four goal explosion, that was very exciting stuff from Philly F. I mean, you say a one game hot streak. The, the man had, has eight points in four games since coming back, six goals. Uh, in the in the four games since his return. So I think Forsberg deserves a little bit more credit than that. He's been on fire, probably one of the streakiest players in the league. When he's on, he is just going to rack up the goals. You can't stop him. And then he just goes quiet for weeks at a time, once or twice a season. Very frustrating fantasy. And I have to say, as a guy who has had him on my roster many years in a row, but definitely something to the Nashville resurgence and definitely promising for Smashville to see uh, to see the team have been so solid without Forsberg for the past few weeks. Uh, Lewis, I'm going to take us over to my favorite team, jumping from your favorite team in Nashville over to mine in New York. I got two hot streaks I want to talk about. The first is a must discuss, and I think that's I think that's very clear to everyone. Jacob Truba has been absolutely on fire 
four goals and three assists across his last nine games played. A very surprising turn of events. But that's in addition to 31 shots, 23 hits, and 21 blocks, which is very unsurprising if you know anything about Jacob Truba. I think the best news for Truba managers so far this season, though, is that his shot rate is at a career-high 2.8 per games played, up a full extra shot over last year, where his shot rate really, really dipped below two shots per game for the first time in a long time. Uh, over the last nine games, Truba shooting 13%, which is much too high for a defenseman, but he's shooting a very nice 6.9% over the full year, which is still too high, but just a touch so. Like, he maybe should have three goals instead of four. Nothing where you're going to be like, oh, sell, 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 sell. Uh, eight of his nine points this season also on the even strength, which is good since Truba really has no shot at eclipsing Adam Fox on power play one. So we're not looking at a situation where he's just racking up the points in an unsustainable power play role. Even with this hot run, Truba is now pacing for just 35 points over a full year. And if you look at those full season underlyings, it looks pretty reasonable under the hood. So even though many folks are likely looking at the recent production and wondering what could be with Truba, I'd look at those full season rankings in your individual league, and that's about where I'd expect him to continue for the full season. And if you can sell him as this, you know, 50 plus point defenseman with perfect peripherals, then definitely go off. But otherwise, I would continue to ride the Truba wave. Uh, Lewis, anything to add on Jacob T.? Yeah, I think, you know, you're talking about potentially selling him high. Another thing you could try and do is maybe wait until he hits a bit of a cold stretch. And if people aren't paying as much attention to those lovely peripherals that he's providing in addition to the scoring that he's been putting up, if they're upset with uh, a lack of scoring from him when, you know, inevitably when you have a, you know, 35-ish point defenseman who goes on a cold streak, you're going to have several games in a row with some empty empty stats there. Maybe that's something that you can grab. Uh, of course, another great maize and blue defenseman. Uh, and the second New York Ranger that I want to talk about tonight is uh, Dryden Hunt. You know, many folks are talking about the Capo Caco breakout, but we go deeper on short shifts, right, Lewis? We're, we're talking Dryden Hunt. It's deep cuts only on short shifts. Hunt is very under the radar, probably because he's averaging about 10 minutes per night, but he's been a really solid bottom sixer for the Rangers, and he's now up to five points in five games since moving up to the top line with Panarin and Strom. I wouldn't advise chasing Hunt in anything but deeper leagues, but will say, for those who have asked, and and we did get a question about this on uh, the Discord, I, I am open to a bit of a breakout or a hot streak, maybe, and... The reason why I say that, I'll compare him to Colin Blackwell in his role last year, who had a 38-point pace over the full season, but most of that production came when he was put on Panarin's line, which included one stretch where he went 12 points in 12 games. So I will say he's kind of the poor man's capo caco right now. You know, no power play time. He'll be the first piece moved if the line goes cold, whereas I think Kako's leash is a little bit longer, but it has been nice to see Panarin also start to get his game together. He has seven points in his last four and is finally over that point per game pace. So a bit more of a deep cut Dryden Hunt, but somebody who I'm interested in and happy to see him uh, produce for the Rangers. Yeah, I think anytime you can get someone who is riding along with Panarin, who's capable of generating just so much offense, you know, you're inevitably going to be touching some bucks that he ends up putting in the back of the net or feeding to someone else who does so. So yeah, I think definitely worth keeping an eye on him. You know, I talked about Kyle Ocposo as a potential option uh, last episode and in those very deep leagues, but I think I would prefer Dryden Hunt over Ocposo um, just because, you know, we know the kind of offense that uh, New York is able to generate. Uh, So, yeah, that's another guy that I might take a look at. Lewis, I hate to quote a phrase here, but stop trying to make Kyle Ocposo happen. Kyle Ocposo is making Kyle Ocposo happen. He already has an assist tonight against Florida. All right, let's move on to one more cold streak. Uh, One more that was requested on the Discord. So if you want to have your question responded to on the pod, you know, feel free to toss it up there. This is from patron Patrick of Tier 1 Sweden of the Knife Town Toddlers who edged me in week two. He asks, is it time to give up on John Gibson? 
Uh, Gibson, of course, is having a bit of a cold streak of his own. He's only got one win in his last five games. Of those five, only two were quality starts, and the win was not included. Uh, he's been under an 890 save percentage in the last three games and posted negative goals saved above average in each of those games as well. Probably is worth mentioning also that Ryan Getzlaff suffered a potentially serious ankle injury. He's been an important factor in most of the Troy Terry goals. Uh, Terry was able to find some success Wednesday without Getzlaff, but Stolarz was the benefit officiary getting the win, not Gibson. It was a pretty ugly win, too. I think it ended up being 6-5. You know, in terms of whether it's time to let go on Gibson, maybe you can afford to let Gibson go in shallow leagues where rates and wins are more important than volume, if you must, or if there are some nice options on the waiver wire like a Samsonov or a Merz Lickens, like we said, talking shallow league. Um, But I think I would hold on to him, especially in points leagues or leagues that value saves. The Ducks were going to come back to earth in terms of their scoring, and thus their wins were going to slow down as well. Um, but Gibson still has very little competition for starts. He's capable of playing very well. And honestly, the stretch hasn't been great, but it's only dragged his save percentage down to 915. That's still above average. In any league that values volume, like the Cacupful, he's still going to be very valuable. He's actually 14th overall in the Cacupful. Uh, which is wild considering that he's had some struggles lately, um, but he's still putting up nice points totals for you each night. So I would say for most leagues, no, it is not time to drop John Gibson. He is not as good as he has been earlier in this season, but he is also not as bad as he has been over this last five game stretch. Yeah, I mean, honestly, you look at those games, the most recent start for Gibson, a four goal against win on the road against LA. All right, not a, not ideal, but not the worst. Before that, a four goal against loss to Toronto. Prior to that, a five goal against loss to Colorado. Uh, prior to that, you know, a 3-2 loss to Nashville. Uh, 2-1 loss to Carolina. There have been some issues here with getting wins, but overall, I think it's pretty reasonable to see why John Gibson might have struggled against some of the toughest opponents that uh, that any team is going to face. He is likely to start against Calgary later this week, so maybe we see one more rough start, but my hope would be that he starts to bounce back, and I honestly don't think I'd be giving up on Gibson uh, anywhere. Maybe now is the time to start to shoot that by low just in case somebody is, you know, looking at last year's numbers and think, oh God, it's happening again. He's, he's about to just absolutely destroy my, my rate stats. So I don't know. I'd rather shoot a by low offer than I would be to cut him outright from my roster. Lewis, that's all the time that we have for tonight. Thank you so much for joining me and thank you to our listeners for joining us. Uh, Lewis, why don't you walk us on out of here? Hey, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, everybody. Uh, please be sure to give us a follow at Short Shifts KK, as well as Brian and Elon at Keeping Carlson, Dave Benton of the Stream Scheme at NHL Stream Scheme. Also recommend you follow at Game Day Lines, at Game Day Goalies, and at Game Day News uh, to get all of the great content that uh, Shams, patron uh, extraordinaire, puts out there for us. That's all the news that you need, really. Uh, visit the great sites we research our episodes with at Yahoo, Frozen Tools, Natural Stat Trick, and Cuckupful.com. Our intro and outro music was created by pat roach and until we see you next time play smart and i've held it in long enough michigan beat the hated buckeyes they're headed to the big 10 championship go blue beat iowa and keep your shifts short